I'm humming this time because a couple of people last video said, Oh my god, I hate it when you whistle. That's just so awful. I can't stand it. One of them even cussed me. He said, Why do you whistle in every video? So, actually, it doesn't matter what I do, it's always going to upset somebody. <laughs> These are a, a couple of uh, viewer-requested videos, if you will. Um, facts, logic, and wisdom, above all else. One of the many countless things I find shocking. And that is, of course, due to connotation in the sort of atomistic society we live in. That uh, metaphysics has been painted. If it's ever brought up, the words uh, like occult or something else is used... You know, Aristotle wrote a nice tome on metaphysics. The greatest minds who ever lived that are the basis for all scientific, logical thought and reasoning vis-a-vis -vis Plato. Can you hear that barking dog in the distance? That's a crazy neighbor. Yeah. Don't you love it? You, you ever had a bad neighbor? <laughs> the greatest scientists who ever lived wrote an enormous amount about metaphysics, and ultimately that's all that's important. The unexamined life is not a full life. Um, sometimes I think I don't have a full life because I've spent so much time in books. But I mean, I used to skydive every day and cave dive every day. And a lot of people said I've lived the life of James Bond. I've had many people tell me that. I kind of find that really peculiar. But I did find an enormous amount of time because I wasn't actually occluded like everybody else. I was a teenager and a 20-something and a 30-something, you know. Um, chasing after, uh, you know, love interests and all that other stuff that I found an enormous amount of time and I had the proclivity to understand things that nobody else, number one, studies. And two, if you tell them about it, they don't get it. Their minds are geared towards physics and their minds are geared towards things that are palpable and demonstrable, i.e. objective phenomena. And that, of course, is the mass hysteria that we actually live in today. And if you actually take something that's metaphysically pure and you uh, overlay it from the filter of atomism, then you end up with something that's twisted and horrible and doesn't even resemble the original. I was talking about so-called breath, and I never use the word meditation because it doesn't refer to anything specifically. You could find any dictionary.com or Wikipedia entry for the definition for meditation, and it doesn't refer to anything specifically. Or specifically, I want to talk about uh, so-called breath, and uh, many people say, well, I do this, and it actually makes my life calm. And that, of course, is undeniable. There are many things that would make a person's life calm, including doctor-prescribed pharmaceuticals. You know, you could sit there and be the happiest person on earth, you know, sitting in uh, an adult diaper watching the Cartoon Network, and you know, peace will just flow over you. There won't be any stress in your life. You won't have anything to worry about. Yeah, it'll just all be really calm. So that's not in question, and that's the thing that, over the decades, I've found that people can't get over. I say, all of these things are calming. I say, well, you know, I just have a really stressful day. And, you know, I engage in meditation, and I focus on my breath. I say, wait a minute now. Let's, let, let's, you know, metaphysics are not something other than physics. People, rationalists, and by rationalists I mean atomists, they think that physics are logical and rational. But so is metaphysics. Let's be perfectly honest and logical here. How on earth, let's just be fair to yourself and myself and just, let's see if the center holds. How would focusing on the physical air coming in and out of your lungs, please ask yourself this question, I guarantee you never have. How would that actually be part and parcel to wisdom? How would it in any way be connected to transcendence? How is that possible? And by transcendence, of course, I mean disobjectification. The ancient passages, both in Sanskrit and Pali, like Suvi Mutta Chattasana Bhanna, the thoroughly liberated nous or spirit, means Nirvana, or Bhavani Rodha Nabhanna, or Yoga Chitta Vritti Niroda. If you want to use the word meditation, which I certainly don't care, I never ever use the word because it doesn't refer to anything specifically. If we could say yoga, yeah, in the passage, uh, Yoga Chitta Vritti Niroda. Yeah. 
yoga or the culminative practice thereof. Yoga is from the Pali word yukta, which means to yoke to. What is it that you're yoking to? What is pulling one thing out from another? You know, what is purification? As I've said many countless times, and this is also to a passage from ancient Pali literature, gold is extracted. There's no such thing as gold or silver purification. People say, well, you've got to purify gold. And I used to be a person that bought gold bullion back when I was younger and do metals speculation. You know, like 0.999 pure, right? Well, there's some really pure gold. It's essentially 100% pure gold or silver. But, I mean, is it not the case that gold and silver are always gold and silver? What do we mean by purification? We, of course, mean extraction. So, in the passage, the very, very famous passage, Yoga Chitta Vritti Naroda. Yoga, which you know the word yoga. The true practice of yoga, and I don't mean a, a woman in, in spandex tights, you know, sitting in some sort of, uh, you know, lotus position, twisting her body like a pretzel. I'm talking about the original meaning and implication, the denotation thereof. What is it that you're yoking to that's actually leading to transcendence? Yoga is chitta vritti naroda. Chitta would be nus or spirit, yeah? Vritti is perturbation, modulation, yeah? Naroda, the subjugation or ending thereof, the cutting off of. So, the fulfillment of yoga is the cutting off of mind or spirit perturbations. So, yeah, we can actually get to the heart of the matter, right? Let's again ask ourselves the question, what is it that focusing on the breath, the actual physical breath coming in and out of your lungs would do? Well, how would that be any different than the gas that's passing out your other end after eating a bowl of beans? Like if you were to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on the breath, you know, all oh, the breath that's coming in and out of your lungs. No, I'm focused on the other breath. I find that more helpful. And people say, well, I know it works because it makes me calm, you know, I'm so agitated and like the dog is barking over here, you know, the neighbors, the horrible neighbors that, you know, have their dog right now out in the rain and it's barking because it wants attention or it's, you know, yeah, I just feel so peaceful, you know, I live in a stressful city and jobs and bills and taxes. And I said, oh, this is true, but can we get to the heart of the matter? And I found mostly so that people can't. They actually cannot examine things a lot, most Nearly all, actually, after decades of talking to people about this stuff, and I don't care what anybody does. Like, this is my practice. How dare you assault my practice? It makes me feel calmer. Well, of course it does. Well, let's be honest with yourself. But how? And when you ask them this question, that's where they seize up, like a frozen engine with that oil. Ah! You don't dare ask them that question. It's like, well, how is that connected to transcendence, to the growing of wisdom, to disobjectification? Because we're talking about yoga here, the real yoga, okay? Or you're yoking to something, yeah, instead of phenomena and materiality and objectivity. Well, I don't know. We're talking about metaphysical symbolism here, not the literal breath, but the animus of life. Of course, you know the word for soul is Atman, right? The Pali word for Atman is Aten, which, by the way, is the exact same word in ancient Egyptian. Eh? Did you know that? So, we have that same root word in English, atmon, atmospheric, atmosphere, yeah, meaning the winds, the weather, whew, the blowing of winds, literally the air. But we're talking about the pneumatic principle. This is metaphysical symbolism for the soul. So, what's been lost, which of course is many things regarding anamnesis, apophaticism, the methodology is the ancient methodology. And the neti neti, the negative theurgic principle of disobjectification or apophaticism has been completely lost. This is metaphysical symbolism for the animating principle. Every ancient culture, whether it's Egyptian, Greek, Indian, whatever, yeah, they also say, well, I mean, there's no more in-breathing and out-breathing. You, know, you know, the thing that keeps you, because people stop breathing. It's like, that guy's dead. Well, how do you know? Well, there's no more breath coming in and out. Of course, air is invisible. We can kind of feel it if we wave our hands. This is just metaphysical symbolism. But today, really this started about, ooh, uh, well, it started really a few, several centuries ago in its roots, but on strong in the past uh, century and a half, you know, especially when the Westerners brought this stuff back. It's been literalized. So I'm going to focus on the physical nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide passing in and out of my lungs. 
I ask you again to be honest with yourself. If not with me, then at least with yourself. How, well, this does make you calm. How is this connected in any way to liberation, growing a wisdom, transcendence, and disobjectification? It logically can't be. Well, it makes me calm. You know, once again, how dare you, you know, criticize uh, my practice. I love the one that, when they use the word practice. These things that are literalized, the metaphysical symbolism and principles of disobjectification and theurgy, are lost, and they are l literally made into this materialistic, objective concepts. Here's another example. I've been translating ancient Pali now for 24 years. Uh, every Pali passage that I know of talks about uh, the kakravartan or the dhammakaku, uh, meaning wheel turner, as in translated, incorrectly translated. And here's the passage that you'll see over and over again in dozens of different translations from dozens of different so-called translators, which are not translators at all. And they say the Buddha, for example, the Buddha or Gautama, it turns the wheel of the law, we said Dhamma, actually we say Prakriti, or nature, or natura nature. He turns the wheel, yeah? If you don't actually have the key or the clavis, the paraphrasable core of what's being taught, then nothing can be understood. The actual Pali does not say turns the wheel. Yeah, you see the symbolism through, whether it be Mahayana, Theravada, Zen, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, they have those uh, silver prayer wheels in Tibet, and the locals come up and a prayer, and they'll like, take the wheel and they'll turn it. Yeah? It's like this wheel you can literally spin. And that has been now, for nearly 2,000 years, a complete and total misrepresentation and mistranslation. It's literally been that long. Factually, it has been translated as the, turning the wheel. What it actually says, and it's a distinction with a huge difference, is it says, is that which turns the wheel. Now, today's axles and cars and stuff turn, but everything back there with wheels on it and carts, blah, blah, blah. The axle was, of course, like, you know, a, a pole, you know, a nice straight pole that was pulled by something else like horses, whatever, a human being, for example. It didn't turn. But it was the unmoved mover. It was the ancient metaphysical symbolism for the absolute. The unmoved mover is the most ancient, one of the most ancient principles regarding the absolute or the agathon, God, I don't care what word you use, since time immemorial. So it doesn't say turns the wheel of Dhamma. It says, is that which turns the wheel, i.e. the unmoved mover. This is the reason why the most ancient Buddhist iconography show this huge little called Buddha Pada, these huge stone carvings of the Buddha's feet, yeah. And it's all about metaphysical symbolism. In the center of the foot, right smack, super dead center, they carved this perfect wheel with all these little radial spokes, yeah. And at the center, the foot is centered dead over this raised axle, the hub or the nabi. It means you're standing, it's like a clock, you know, we judge time, hours and minutes, right? Well, think about the, uh, the axle you know, which is unmoved. Technically, there's some little gears around the axle which turn the minute and the second hand. What it says is that in the case of the absolute of transcendence, the absolute or the summum bonum or the Mahapurisha, the great person, specifically the great spirit, not person as empirical person, you are that unmoved axle pin, just like the center pin of any clock, right? No one looks at the center pin of a clock because you can't tell time by it, right? Because no time exists right at the center. We rip the hands off the clock, we would never be able to tell time, right? We have the unmoved mover, the axle pin. So this is the premise. And the point I made in talking about that is that this metaphysical symbolism has been lost to the sands of time and completely corrupted by materialists. That's what they are. Here's a passage from Jimmy Nikkei 3.82, one of my translations. Uh, he wisely trains thusly, I shall breathe in, beholding that which lies before the arising of the body's formation. He wisely trains thus, I shall breathe out, beholding that, or revelation thereof, I, the theurgy and anamnesis of seeing, not literally seeing objectively, by retracting oneself, but seeing in, in the, the sense of a spiritual seeing. Yeah, We actually call this the, the dibakakus translated literally as heavenly eye, but it means transcendent vision, transcendent understanding, not seeing with these two eyes. I shall breathe out, beholding that which lies before the arising of the body's formation. So this is all apophaticism. This is negative theology. Yeah. This has nothing to do with breath. 
You cannot logically and intelligently argue to me or anybody on this earth that wisdom and transcendence is in any way rooted in focusing on the physical air passing in and out of somebody's lungs. It's antithetical to facts, logic, reason, and common sense. It's nonsense. It was like, but it makes me feel so calm. You know, I'm at peace. And this is not in dispute. Here's a uh, from, um, see, this is uh, from Nyanya Volkya, the Briyadranyaka Upanishad, right? The same principle exists in the Vedas over and over and over again, also too, in the principle of Upanishad. This is Nyanya Volkya. By the way, does this name sound Indian or Nordic? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Gautama, the Buddha that people make reference to. Uh, Sakyaputta. Sakyamuni. That's not a name, by the way. It literally means sage of the Scythians. The Pali word Sakya means Scythian. Yeah, the Scythians were Nordic people. Last ice age, they actually came down. There's several rivers that dump from... Uh, from northern Germany and uh, Scandinavia into what is today northern India. Tell me if this name sounds Indian. Of course, India didn't exist back then either. The name, uh, principal character in the Briyadaranyaka Upanishad's name is Yanya Valkya. Please tell me if that sounds Nordic or Indian, specifically meaning Tamil. Anyway, this is Yanya Valkya. Um, demonstrate to me the Brahman in the face of Brahman that uh, yourself is within self with a capital S, i.e. The, the Atman or the soul, but Yanyavalkya, what is self is that that's in all things? That which breathes together with the in-breath or prana is both yourself and the all within. That which breathes out with your breathing, apamma, is yourself and the all within, once again, capital S. That which distributively breathes with you, Distributive breath of Yama is, of course, yourself and the all within. They didn't have radios back then, okay? I argue to you logically and intelligently. Since, and I've said this many countless videos, there's no signal in the radio, right? Right? We could say the radio breathes in the signal, and of course it... And it animates a radio. When you turn on a radio, they say the radio's alive. Not literally, but in a roundabout sense. The ancients used this metaphysical symbolism, metaphysical symbolism of the breath, the same way we conceive of a radio, analogously, nearly perfectly so. You know, that the radio breathes in, of course a radio doesn't breathe in a signal, but the antenna essentially does, it tunes it in. The metaphysical symbolism, of course, for the animating spirit is, of course, the air, but not literal air, but the pneumatic principle, i.e. the Atman. It's not about literal air passing in and out of your lungs or air passing out your backside after a bowl of beans. That's antithetical. To, you just put, don't, if you're not going to be honest to me, at least be honest with yourself. This is what is actually said. But when it is interpreted through the filter of materialism, it becomes focus on your breath. Like, my literal breath? <gasps> Yeah, 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 your literal breath. You see, you feel calm? It's like, yeah, I did an hour of it, and I feel so much more peaceful. I was so stressed today. It's been a hard day's work. I feel so much better. There is nobody on any YouTube video and no book that I know of where anybody's talking about this fact, you know? Why? Well, I actually know the answer to that. I'm begging the question, of course. Um, this... Just, just think about it. Just take a consideration. Is are we talking about the literal breath, or are we talking about the pneumatic principle? Which makes more sense? You can't focus on the pneumatic principle objectively. Obviously, it's the subject. Tatva masi, that thou art, right? Aham brahmasmi. So it cannot be focused on objectively because it is the subject. The subject is precedes the object of either identification or negation. So. But this is just the metaphysical symbolism of the animating principle, i.e. the true self or soul. Yeah, they just use that metaphysical symbolism of the breath, the air, but not literal air, the pneumatic principle. It shocks me, actually, to the core, and almost nothing shocks me, that people don't realize this very, very simple fact. And you tell them this, and they look at you strange. It's like, excuse me, so <clears throat> you don't like what I had to say. But do you think focusing on literal gas passing in and out of your lungs is in any way connected to transcendence? It can't be. 
Well, how dare you assault my practice? Well, I'm not. I'm just saying be logical with me. If not with me, then with yourself. Thanks so much for watching. Just maybe think about it. Poor neighbors and their barking dog.